There was a great bass player from Boston years ago named John Nevs. He played with the Herb Pomeroy band, and he played a lot with with Jackie Byard, who was Mingus's uh, pianist for quite a while. And he just, you know, he said one time, he said, yeah, he said, there's only 12 notes. You're bound to get most of them right. Yeah, right. You know? (laughs) Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath. So glad to have you here today. And check out everything we've done for the past decade plus at ContrabassConversations.com. This is the first week I've ever done an all jazz theme. And I can't believe in all these years I haven't done that. What we're doing this week is every weekday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week, we are putting out an episode profiling a great jazz artist doing creative things in the world today. And then Friday, we're going to put out a compilation of some highlights from all the artists I've spoken with like Rufus Reed, Ron Carter, Carlos Henriquez, Chuck Israels, and many others. And you can find these episodes and everything I've done in the world of jazz for this podcast at ContraBaseConversations.com slash jazz. I know you're going to love today's episode featuring Bob Nesky, who teaches at Brandeis and the New England Conservatory. And he's worked with George Russell, Stefan Grappelli, so many amazing artists. He's also a, a composer and a band leader. He's constantly involved in new projects. It was such a great conversation. And we sit down and dig into why we shouldn't watch the left hand where we play, intonation and the jazz bassist, at Bob's journey from bass to tuba to composition to classical guitar and finally back to bass and much more. I had so much fun chatting with Bob. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Diderio Strings. We're doing a giveaway of Kaplan Strings, which people love for jazz and for classical. They have a rich tonal color palette. They've got superb bow response. They've got great control and versatility through the dynamic spectrum. And I know that Daniel Kimbrough uses them in his new grass playing and Brandino uses them on all sorts of recording projects. Like all D'Addario strings, they're crafted in the D'Addario facility in New York, here in the United States. And we are doing a giveaway for 10 sets of Kaplan strings. If you go to ContrabassConversations.com slash strings, enter that giveaway. I'd love to see you with these great strings. They're on my bass right now. They play great. Love them. I'd also like to thank the Bass Violin Shop. And they have a wide selection of bows. French bows, German bows, from entry-level student bow to Frechner, Nuremberger, all sorts of great models of bow. And each bow is personally selected prior to sale to ensure that customers can choose from the very best. You can find them at BassViolinShop.com, and they are the Southeast's largest inventory of laminate hybrid carved double basses. Check them out, and thanks for sponsoring, guys. I'd also like to thank Rosin Saver, which I've been using for several months now. The Rosin Saver, it keeps your rosin feeling fresh. It works. It's super cool. My pops has been in that since the beginning of the year, maybe even December, and it's like it was new. It's the first time that's ever happened to me with rosin, and it's not just me that's finding this. People in the New York Philharmonic, the Met Orchestra, LA Phil, Cleveland Orchestra, many others are using Rosin Saver. And since you're listening to this podcast, if you use the promo code HEATH, H-E-A-T-H, my name, you get 10% at checkout off any and all orders. That's rosinsaver.com, promo code HEATH. All right, here we go with our conversation with Bob Nesky. And you're going to be hearing this super cool tune that we actually talk about in the episode. It is Motor On. So we'll start and end with a little bit from Motor On. And I'm so thrilled to bring you this interview with Bob Nesky. Can we just talk about the base book a little bit? I I really sure. I really like the layout and sort of 
some of the things that I saw over and over, and like one thing that I uh, connected with is you. I think you stress repeatedly: don't look at the left hand, don't look at the left hand fingers. Yeah. How does how does looking how does that hamper development for people? What have you seen? Well, for one thing, there's no good angle. You're always you're always seeing it unless unless you're moving your eye level you know, exactly with your finger level, then you'd be, you know, doing uh, knee bends or something while you're playing. Because what you're, what you're doing is you're seeing it from a distorted angle. So what you think maybe is straight is actually, you know, it looks straight to the eye, but you're actually seeing it at, at um, you know, the low, the low string is going to be, is going to be higher up than the, uh, than the G string. So I think if you're, if you're looking at your hands when you're crossing the strings, one of the hardest things I've found with even myself, I'm constantly reminding myself when I'm crossing the strings to keep it consistent. And, uh, you know, we have a tendency, for instance, some people, I'm, and I'm talking, you know, primarily about, about young players, but I've noticed um, in myself the same tendencies. If, you know, if your uh, left elbow has it sometimes people have a tendency to have their left elbow, you know, pointing downwards towards the ground that can have a tendency to, you know, your hand is going to follow where your elbow is. So if you're moving, so if your elbow, if you're, if you're a little lazy, I suppose is what it comes down to, then your, then your hand may kind of, kind of gravitate out of, out of position. And I know myself when I, when I'm crossing the strings, I have to, uh, especially in the in the lower positions, I have to kind of think mentally that I'm actually going more up towards the uh, the scroll as I get down lower because my hand has a tendency to, as I cross the strings, when I get lower, my hand my fingers have a tendency to creep up a little bit. So there's and I even um, sometimes it's a like a mental a mental thing with me, I'll point, I'll feel like I'm pointing my first finger towards the sky. And I'm not actually doing that, but that's a sort of a mental checkpoint um, to make sure that I don't, that I don't, you know, go sharp. Um, with the, with the exercises, I think, I mean, you'll notice that I'm, I'm kind of a stickler for intonation, which is a, which is for a jazz player. That's kind of a surprise to hear. Because I would say most jazz players don't play in tune very well. The younger ones, I think, maybe are. I mean, there's a lot. Larry Grenadier and people like that play in tune very well. Charlie Hayden always played in tune really well. But some guys, when they, especially when they pick up the bow, then you can you can really hear the uh, the pitch problems that you don't hear when they're you know just plucking. I always want to have some, those exercises are, are set up so that there are a lot of, of perfect intervals where you can always, you can always check with an open string or check with a perfect fifth or something like that. Like those very first, no, those very first ones. I totally noticed that you got a lot of like open D's and G's and you're in half position, first position. And yeah, you can hear, I think you even talk about like making sure that you don't hear any beats in the sound. Yeah, going for the pure, you know, the pure tone. And I'll have, you know, there's there's some fingering exercise where you're playing the same, you're playing, say you're playing an A on the G string and then your, the next note is the open D. I'll, I'll have you play the A on the D string with the second finger and then the first finger and go, you know, so that you can check that, that shift. And those are the kinds of, these are like the kinds of exercises that I would make up for myself because I'm kind of I'm kind of self-taught as a bass player. I took lessons for a couple of years in high school with a wonderful Italian, old-school Italian guy named Anthony Bevavino. Mm, mm-hmm. That's a great name because it means drink wine. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and he he brought me through the uh, you know I went through the Samandel book one in the first two years there, and then I had some tendon problems, so I quit playing. And I switched to um, I switched to tuba. Oh, okay. Tuba was my instrument for the first uh, six months that I was at New England Conservatory. Although I was not a good tuba player, 
but I was a composition major, so I didn't have to be a good tuba player. And then from that, I switched to classical guitar, and my hand was okay doing that. I did that for a couple of years, and then I went back to back to bass. So from that time on, I was you know pretty much a self-taught bass player. And the exercises, I don't like practicing. I never have, so I like to try to be as efficient as I can be when I practice. So those exercises, they're all, uh, many of them are, are written in specific modes so that you can get an idea of, of you know, being a, coming from the jazz side of things. I'm coming from sort of a modal, uh, a modal side of, of improvising because it's, you don't have to think about the chord changes quite so much if you're thinking in terms of large harmonic areas. So I figured I would write, I would write exercises that, you know, one one exercise for each mode, kind of thing, so that you can get some ear training um, along with the the hand training. I like the way you describe the modes. I think you're talking is the description of white light and a prism, and and the, it's a it's a poetic description, but it's a gr- real. I I really connected with that. Can you maybe talk about about how you describe the modes? Sure. Yeah. The um, the the white light you can think of is is you know has all contains all of the colors. If you think about the the major scale, then you know within within that major scale are all of the modes. So the so the scale. I mean, you could take the major scale, or um, I studied with this guy and, and actually played with him for a while. Uh, George Russell, wonderful, uh, amazing composer, and, and he he looks at it as the Lydian scale being the being the most at rest scale, but whichever way you look at it, um, the Lydian or the major, um, all of the other modes are contained with it, and all of the other modes have a different have different colors to them because of the placement of because of where the half steps show up. So every you know, so the major has the half step between two and three and seven and eight, and then if you start on the second note, the Dorian, then the half steps shift over one you know one spot to the left so then you have a half step between two and three and you've got that sound that we associate with minor and the same thing yeah so you take white light and you shine it through a prism and you see all of you see the different um components of it clearly and so i'm i'm always thinking about you know which mode i'm working with for for a particular tune and you can even in your if you're soloing over something say like um well actually the best examples or that that most people would be familiar with is uh, miles davis's solo on so what and if you look at if you look at what he's playing it's a you know it's a d minor 7 chord and then it goes up a half step to an you know, E flat minor seven chord. So when he's playing, you know, the first time through, he's just, he's playing in D Dorian for the most part over the D minor situation. And then he goes up, you know, to E flat Dorian when it, go, when it moves up a half step. The second time through, he starts off outlining a C major triad from a, you know, he goes down from G. The first note of the second chorus is a G natural and then he's just playing with a C major triad. So what the, it seems to me very, very clear that he's saying, okay, it's a D, it's a D Dorian situation, but I can play, I can play the relative major of D Dorian, which you know would be C major. So he, so he does that, and is, and he's very clear about it. And then when the chord goes up to, goes up to E flat uh, minor, he goes up to D flat major. And he just continues the same thing. So that's sort of how I think about the modal stuff. And it's it's very freeing melodically. It gives you, it's you know, it's a it's a limitation you can put on yourself to um, to help you with um, not feeling like you're just sitting there with a blank canvas or something, and you have to fill it up. Well, and I like it. it kind of gets you away from being so root bound as a base. You know, I was I was noticing you've got those playthrough exercises, right? Where you go, mm-hmm. it's like linear lines through the chord changes, and I I really like the way you do that. It's it's because that's something I teach a lot. I teach 
young people I teach a, a, a lot of adult amateurs too and that's just something that I see people struggle with a lot is like just how to how to get away from just thinking roots uh, and, and starting to explore other th- especially for soloing possibilities I really like that like you take can you just describe how those I'll link up to these exercises and everything but like how oh, you cool. lay those out yeah well it's a well there's there's a there's a blog post that I put in there about about be, getting you know getting bored when you're playing kind of thing and and so I have um, I actually had T-shirts made uh, for the Brandeis band. On the front it says "What if" and on the back it says uh, "Why not." We end up you know as jazz players, especially in jam session situations where you know there are five horn players and they all want to play everything they know and some stuff that they don't know on the tune. So you end up playing the tune, you know, as a bass player, you may play, you know, go 150 times through it or something. And I found myself and I, and I still do. I, you know, I find myself playing the same thing when I go through the same part of the tune. And I started getting bored with that and thinking, how am I going to get out of this? So then I would, I would start imposing limitations. Some of those, those playthrough things are, the the main idea is that you pick an interval and you pick a direction. So, you know, the the most common thing might you know, for a walking situation would you would pick like the interval of a second. So you pick a second and then you say, I'm gonna go up. So you just start playing seconds, either, you know, major or minor, depending on what tonality you happen to be in at the at the moment. You know, so if you're if it's a C seven chord, then you're gonna go, you know, C D E F G A B flat C, and then the next chord uh, maybe is a F seven chord. Then you would just keep going up. So you would go D E flat. So instead of instead of the E nat, if it was still the C chord, you would, it would you would hit an E natural. But since it's an F7 chord, you change that E natural to an E flat because that fits the chord. And then you keep going up. So E flat, F, G, A, B flat. And you keep going up until you run out of space or until, you know, as, a, as an exercise. Or if you're, you know, if you're playing with a group, sometimes exercises are not so musical. So then you decide, well, I've gone far enough. I'm going to start going down. So what you're doing, you're just, you're just, Picking an interval, which is your limitation, and you're picking a direction and you're playing through the chord. So frequently, you're not going to hit the root on beat one. But if you think about it, most of the chords that we're dealing with in, in jazz are, are four note chords and you know frequently five and six note chords. And there's only 12 notes. So if you're going, if you're going in seconds, your chance that you've got like a, a one out of three chance, if you're dealing with four note chords, you've got a one out of three chance of hitting one of the notes of the chord. Um, so every third note is going to be a, a chord tone. And if it, you're dealing with, a, you know, with six note chords, like, you know, with some alterations, then you've got a 50-50 chance. No, just by playing randomly, you've got a 50-50 chance of hitting a note in the chord. And if you don't hit a note in the chord, you're a half step away from a note in the chord. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, that can kind of simplify. There was a great bass player from Boston years ago named John Nevs. He played with the Herb Pomeroy band, and he played a lot with with Jackie Byard, um, who was uh, Mingus' uh, pianist for quite a while. And he just, you know, he said one time, he said, yeah, he said, there's only 12 notes. You're bound to get most of them right. Yeah, right. You know, (laughs) it's like, yeah, so it doesn't have to be all complicated. And we have a tendency, I think, especially as, as well as, you know, jazz musicians, we're ultimately composers. So this gets back to your, your composition thing. And if you think of, you know, composers, there's very, you know, I was, I was a classical composition student at, at New England Conservatory and I studied with this guy uh, Tom McKinley who was a wonderful he was also a wonderful jazz pianist but a lot of what we talked about was 
kind of, you know, theoretical, mathematical, a little bit of, you know, calculations kind of things, a lot of, a lot of head, head work. And, um, then I started doing my, um, I took some time off. Then I went back, uh, you know, a year later and worked on, did my master's there. And I studied with this guy, Bob Seeley. And the first lesson, Seeley said, just, you know, just imagine the best music you can and try to write it down. And it was like, wow. You mean I, so this is, this guy is giving me permission to do more of the what if, why not kind of thing, you know, just not so rule oriented, you know, for, for many years, the classical contemporary composition stuff to, to my ears and my, from my experience was much more kind of rigid in the language that you were able to use. And if you didn't use that language, even in, in the conservatories, if you didn't, if you wanted to write something that was kind of tonal, they would, they would say, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> right. you sure. know, um, but I think now in that, in that field, the, you know, the composers who I, who I see now are doing, it's, it's like, you can almost do anything you want. You know, you could have, you know, you could have a thing that sounds like, you know, like Elliot Carter and then, you know, another section that, that sounds like, you know, Philip Glass or something or something that's, you know, much more tonally static, which I think is, is nice. You know, the, the musical world is, is maybe, uh, broadening well i love that idea of like not being so rule rule bound and that's a great i that's a great idea for a t-shirt the what if why not that's a mm-hmm. it's a good a good philosophy for music in general you've got the stretching chords concept uh and yes. you're talking about pairing the fifths like a cg and an eb or a cg and an ae and i think uh, um, right. yeah can you just talk through that concept i really like uh how you describe thinking of chords in that way yeah well it's i i think maybe part of that comes from trying to work on intonation and that there are there are certain intervals that for my hands anyway i find to be grounding um in terms of the pitch so and and here again you know your perfect fifths they're easy to tell if you're in tune when you're when you're playing them so if i take you know, so for instance, if you wanted to, if you have a, some sort of a C major tonality, you could play the C and the G. This is, um, you know, it's a perfect fifth. And then you, you just take that and you shift it. You keep the hand position exactly the same and you go up and you would, I would play an A and an E. So you're playing the C and the G on the, uh, in the, uh, what Samantha would call the, what, the second position. And then you move up to I don't know what it is with the seventh position or something with the with the A on your first finger on the D string, and then the E. So you're playing two you're playing two stable two stable intervals in terms of pitch, because it's the same it's the same interval and there's only one shift involved with it. So it's pretty safe and it also is a it's a nice way of moving through moving through the instrument registerally if that's the word you know it's a, it's a nice way to get from the you know from the mid mid to low register up to the you know mid to high register with only with only one shift and you're staying in the you know you're staying in the in the tonality and everything is is kind of safe yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure <laughs> and and safe and secure and then you know and then you can take if you were turning it into a, if it turned in from like a C major chord, even though I'm, I'm using the, the sixth in the chord, you know, the A, which works great with the C major tonality. Um, if it turns into a C dominant seventh, then you do the same thing. You're making the same shift, except, and your hand position is the same, where you've got the first finger on the A and the fourth finger on the E, except you just throw your second finger down on the B flat above the A. So your outside, your outside fingers are still playing the same thing. You're just putting your second finger down and now you've got a, you've got a C, you know, C dominant seventh chord. And you can do that with, you know, you do that with any things. Um, I have a tune called, uh, called motor on. It's going through a, going through kind of a fairly intricate chord progression just using, you know, that idea of stretching the chords. 
I, I like the way you're describing, like the opening up the reg, registrally, if that's the name. That that it's because it's cool to pot. That's a nice wide. Uh, well, it ends up being a tenth, right? If you're thinking of C up to yeah, the E, right? Yeah, yep. yeah. And you've got that whole section on tenths uh, in 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 your materials too, and how you do like four uh two four versus two three for the major and minor tenths i i really like right. how that i remember i think rufus reed talks about that in his evolving basis book too like there's okay, a little, sure. little thing on ten but it's such a great sound on the bass it's such a it's, it's such, wonderful yeah and it's a and it's a thing that that you know that's something that the that the classical bass players don't have much of an opportunity to do because if you you can't play them with a bow yeah it's such a it's a you know, it's a very cool thing. It's you know, it's like the uh, the beginning of that tune, Blackbird. Yeah, you know, the Beatles thing. You know, just go. You can play that whole thing on the bass, just in just in tense. It's a little challenging when you get up high to get them. It, it's hard. I have a fairly small bass, and I have somewhat large hands, so that that helps. You know, if you're playing on a you know like a giant classical instrument, it would be well, it would be a challenge. Also depends on your on your your setup and every you know all of that stuff and the the idea of of the of doing it with you know two and three or you know the minor one with two and three is it two and three or one and three I I can't remember but it but it I, I think know. it's two and three okay stretching across and then but the idea there again is that is that the with a, with a minor tenth you're using your third finger on the G string and with a major tenth, you would just add your fourth finger on top of that so that you're here again, you're, you're trying to create a stable as little motion as possible in the left hand for the pitch so that your second and third, so your, your low note on the E string is played. I'm, I'm thinking, in my head, the second finger, and then the third finger is on the G string, and that stays stable throughout. So you could do the same that same playthrough type of thing, or just just go up, you know, a diatonic scale, playing you know major and minor tenths up the up the scale. You know, maybe you like a, take a G major G major scale or something, and just go up in seconds. So it would, would be a you know G major tenth going to an A minor tenth going to a a B, uh, B minor tenth, and so you're. So the only thing that you're changing, you're moving the the hand position up. You know the notes of the scale on the on the E string, and the only thing that's changing um, in your left hand is you're either lifting your fourth finger up or putting your fourth finger down. Everything else stays the same. So your chances of staying pretty well in tune are are good it's a cool it's a cool sound and, and yeah that's the that is the challenge as you get up high especially on a on a wide neck bass you get into thumb position oh yeah and those are um and you've got the i love your you've got uh, i like the approach that you have to thumb position too i think you've got the you start by writing everything down an octave uh if i remember right and you like start like an a major scale or or a and running the different modes starting on the thumb and then starting with one as the as the root note uh yes yeah can you just talk through your approach a little bit to teaching thumb position yeah i mean i i came up with the um with the Samandal thing. And that's, you know, generally, you know, obviously the, fir- the first book of the Samandal is, is made for, I think, primarily for orchestral training. So it's not really, you know, dealing with, with soloistic techniques. And I, and I think for the most part, the, um, the thumb went on the G and, and you had your, you know, your open and closed positions, you know, based on, based on that. But that doesn't, in, in terms of, in terms of jazz playing, where you're doing a lot of your soloing right in that in that register, most of the tunes that jazz people play on, you know, for you know the standards are in flat keys, you know, B flat, E flat, F. And I think the reason for that is because the you know a lot of saxophone players wrote those tunes, and, and the saxophones are it's more comfortable to play in those keys for you know for obvious reasons. So if you're playing in flat keys, it just made sense for me to 
if I take, say we're in, say we're, you know, coming in, we're in B flat. So I'm, I'm thinking I, I'll put my first finger on the, on the B flat, you know, on the, on the A string. And then everything is set up for, you know, the B flat major situation. You don't have to move anything and you're in the, you know, you're in the closed position where you have a half step between each, each of your fingers and then to turn it into a minor situation, the B flats, the first finger still stays on the B flat. And the only thing that you're changing is you're moving your thumb back a half a step. So you've got everything you have access to. Actually, you have access to every single mode without. And the only thing you're moving is your thumb, either a half step back or a half step up. Everything else in the position is, is solid. And therefore, you know, with my, my theory of, you know, do the least amount of movement away from us, you know, oh, if you have a safe place, stay there, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. So then you can cover, you know, you can cover all of the modes with, you know, with only moving one finger a half step, you know, either, either up or down, everything else is safe. So your chances are, you know, are very good of, of you know, keeping the, keeping the pitch together. And also, you know, grounding, you know, in terms of your, your thinking, if you're in a safe place, then you can fly, you know, right, a right, bit, a little bit more, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. And it's, it's amazing. As I was looking through that section, you've got, I mean, it's, it's amazing what you can do in that one position, like the range you have. And if you just move your thumb like that, yeah, you can cover all the, all the different modes. And it's, it's amazing what you can do really without shifting. Yeah, it's great. There's a there's a guitar player, um, uh, Kenny Wessel. He played with Ornette for a number of years in his uh, prime time band, and I've gotten to know him because uh, we both teach uh, at the same jazz camp in the in the summer, the the uh, the main jazz camp, which is a cool place. But he was you know he was talking about about you know guitar players trying to go through trying to navigate through chord progressions and um, guitar is a bitch. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. Really a, <laughs> no kidding. It's really hard. And most guitar players are, are very, uh, you know, it's like a chord has a particular pattern to it, or it's, it's like you grab it. It's got a position. You put these fingers here and then, you know, you grab the, you grab the chord and, and especially young guitar players, they, they don't really know what notes they're playing um, they just know that this is the this is the pattern for you know an F7 chord, and if you put your fingers here, and then if if you move it up a step, then you're playing a G7 chord. And and his way of trying to teach guitars is to you know he says that in any position on the guitar you have access to everything you need. You know you have access to every chord and every note that you would ever need to play. And that resonated with me because that, that coincides with, you know, my idea about that you're in that one position. You can do anything you want without moving out of that position. It's just a matter of you have to know, well, you have to know the notes you're playing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not so easy. <laughs> you know? Bob, so great to chat with you. Folks, check out everything we were talking about and much more at his website, bobneske.com. That's B-O-B-N-I-E-S-K-E.com. Thank you so much for listening. This is the first of a whole week of jazz content. Again, ContrabassConversations.com slash jazz will take you back in the archives for all these artists I've spoken with. I'm deeply ashamed that I haven't done a week on jazz. I've done a week on Gary Carr, even. I've done a week on teaching. I've done a week on entrepreneurship. I've done a bajillion episodes on auditions and long overdue. Being primarily a classical player, I sort of think that I'm covering jazz a lot. And then I look back and I think, Jason, come on, you got to talk to more people. So that's what this week is. And as always, if you want to reach out and say hi, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com will get you in touch with me. I answer each and every email and I love hearing from people. That's going to do it for today's episode. More jazz content to come tomorrow. So we will see you again very soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.